people lose more weight on diet soda versus water. Long-term carnivore, keto, high-fat diet patients, triglycerides are getting worse. Blood sugars are getting worse and their blood markers are moving in the wrong direction. You know what happens when you eat a bunch of fat? Like if you're a diabetic for dinner, just drink an entire gallon of heavy cream. And the next morning you'll have the highest morning sugar you've ever seen, even though you eat no carbs at all. All of that fat just slowly makes you fatter and now you're that much more insulin resistant and your sugar's even higher. And a little bit of glucose floating on top that you're measuring with your glucometer. And then you're like, oh, I'll just not eat carbs and I'll be fine. And people just, they don't get it. They don't understand. They do not know what's actually happening. Totally can lose weight eating carbs, but... And that's the problem zone. If someone has 20 pounds to lose, what would you recommend that person eat to try and lose weight? Pure carnivore might shoot some people in the foot, especially people who are volume eaters. I'm sorry, I'm tired of being afraid. Show me an actual human study where this stuff is hurting people, because it's just not there. And in the meantime, I'm not gonna be afraid to eat a salad. Like, what kind of extreme wuss would I be if I was afraid of a vegetable? Before I start the interview, Dr. Ted Naiman and I used the words energy dense energy rich foods, energy calories, energy toxicity, so too much energy. And whenever we're using the word energy, we're referring to fats and carbs. There's three macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs. Proteins help build the body and fats and carbs fuel the body. So for me to be able to talk right now, move my arms, this all requires energy and the energy is coming from fats and carbs. Something like chicken breast has a lot of protein, very little fat and no carbs. So chicken breast, not very energy dense. Whereas something like a ribeye, it has protein, but also fat. So it is more energy dense. And then something like butter, pure fat or honey, pure carbs. Those are very energy rich foods. So anytime we're talking about energy density or energy, we're talking about the fats and carbs in the food. All right, Dr. Ted Naiman, I want to talk about how too much fat can be just as bad as too much sugar. And this is something I've tried to explain in several videos, though I think sometimes people like to hear it from a doctor. And I have had this conversation in the past with Dr. Robert Sivas two years ago and Dr. Gabrielle Lyon a year ago, but I think they were being too scientific in how they were explaining it. So I wanna just try and keep this conversation as straightforward and easy for people to understand. And I'm sure we're going to end up using the word calories to talk about this topic. Though I know that some people will say that you shouldn't use the word calories as it's just a measurement of heat or calories don't matter. And I understand that calories is an arbitrary word and I would rather focus more on the amount of nutrients you're getting from the food, but calories is just the best way and the universal word people use to talk about food intake. So I think we're just gonna use the word calories. Right, and the reality is you have to think about it in terms of carbon atoms. Anytime you ingest carbon atoms, the only way it's leaving your body is when you exhale it. So carbohydrate and hydrocarbon, which is fat, are just these densely packed chains of carbons. So all of your fat and all of your carbs are these super densely packed carbon atoms in these chains, these molecules, right? Uh, that's only leaving your body when you exhale it. Yes, you can exhale faster and, and get rid of it faster. That's called exercise, people. This is calories, right? If you want to think about it as if you don't like calories because it's an abstract thing, your body doesn't have the calorie sensor, just think about all the carbon atoms in that fat. That's the tightest packed carbon you can get. Every single one of those things is only leaving your body when you exhale it. Otherwise, it's stored as fat. And so I agree, calories are just completely arbitrary and made up. But think about the carbons, you know, forget calories. Who cares? Right. And you mentioned to release these carbon atoms, people are forced to do to release carbon dioxide when exercising. Now, I think it's reported 67% of people in America don't exercise. And so for that category of people over the years, they eat a high carb or a standard American diet over the years as they continue to not move their bodies, then their blood work gets worse. Their blood becomes more toxic with the excess energy, blood sugars rise, triglycerides get worse and they become insulin resistant. Then they hear that a way to lower these blood sugars, give insulin a break is to try a high fat, low carb diet. They do that and they see success. They lose weight, 
triglycerides decrease, blood sugars go down, insulin comes down, and they say a high fat, low carb diet is awesome, which it can be. But it's not that meat has any magical powers to it. It's that when people eat a very high protein, satiating, very nutrient dense diet, they tend to be very full and naturally under eat, then they lose weight. Though, if this person continues to not exercise, then their basal metabolic rate will drop, metabolism slow down, and they'll hit a weight loss plateau. And this is where Dr. Robert Sivas was saying that he does a lot of blood work and he'll have long-term carnivore, keto, high fat diet patients, like 10 plus year carnivore people saying that their triglycerides are getting worse, blood sugars are getting worse, and their blood markers are moving in the wrong direction. I would say that a main reason for this is because just like if someone's eating a high carb diet and not moving, if someone's eating a high fat diet and sitting on the couch, eventually, once their metabolism slows down, then if they continue to eat, the same amount of food, they'll be eating a calorie surplus, they'll be over consuming food because they're not exercising. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I love that. So almost everyone is going to eat the calories of a moderately active version of themselves. You're going to eat the calories of a moderately active version of yourself. If you're not moderately active, you're screwed. You're completely hosed. Like you're just going to steadily get fatter. And exercise is a huge part of the equation. And I have so many patients who get just so obsessed with diet. It's just like diet, diet, diet. You know, they won't eat a tomato, too many carbs. They want to eat a cucumber, way too many carbs. You know, they, they just, they're just so focused and religious on their diet. And then they never exercise at all. And there is no amount of dieting that's going to keep them from overeating calories. We, we have the studies to prove it. So when, when you're sedentary, you just automatically eat more than people who are moderately active and you just steadily get fatter. There's this crazy uh, J-shaped curve produced by um, activity down here on the x-axis where if you're moderately active, you're fine. And then as you're more and more and more active, you get better and better and better at matching caloric intake to caloric expenditure. So you might be eating more and more and more, but you're getting thinner and thinner and thinner because you're eating exactly the amount you need. You're just pulling calories at the precise amount you need. Versus if you're sedentary, now it starts going the other direction where you're just actually eating more than if you're moderately active, but you're burning way less. So you're just going to steadily get fatter. Being sedentary is just absolutely a nail in the coffin. This is a major, major problem because you get way diminishing returns trying to um, split hairs on, your, on the diet side. It's interesting that you say that a lot of people eat like moderately active people because at least from my experience with clients, I feel like a lot of people under eat. And I think that's just from years of chronic dieting and wanting to lose weight so they eat less food, hit a weight loss plateau so they eat less food. And just over the years, they kind of go down this metabolism spiral hole where they are not eating like a moderately active person. I feel like they're eating more like a person who's starved. And I think that bodybuilders do a really good job of training their metabolism where they'll go through periods where they're in maintenance, periods where they're eating a food surplus, a food deficit, and they're constantly challenging their body to adapt to different amounts of fuel. Whereas most people, they are never taught this and they just continue to eat the same amount of food around the same time and then their body just adapts to this. So then over the years, their metabolism slows down when really it's just that they didn't train their metabolism. And so I think that the topic of metabolism isn't talked about enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree. I see what you're saying. And there's even more problems with not utilizing exercise, which is that you, you want your metabolism to turn up as high as it can get. You want as much lean mass as you can get. You want to eat as many calories as possible. You want to burn as many calories as possible. And, and I, some of these people who you see that are under eating, that concerns me too, because then you're going to basically lo lose lean mass. And, you know, I think uh, fat loss is just half the equation. The other half of the equation is having as much lean mass as possible. You want tons of bone, tons of muscle high metabolic rate, you're going to steadily lose as you get older and you don't want to have, you know, frailty and sarcopenia and osteopenia and all these problems. So the goal is the highest lean mass is the lowest fat mass. And you really get that by eating a lot, burning a lot and exercising a lot. Right. And I think, well, I have a lot of people who come to me and they're eating like 
800, 1,000 calories, and they'll say, well, Lily, what's the big deal if I'm eating 900 calories? Someone online said that calories don't matter. And sure, but what about nutrients? If you're eating 800-ish calories, what food or what do your meals look like where you're getting in enough vitamin A, choline, copper, iron, selenium, vitamin B6? I don't know what meal someone would be eating that's 800 calories where they're getting all of the micronutrients they need in the right amounts. So I'll try to help my clients reverse diet, eat more food slowly, build their metabolism, not gain weight, but then still get in all of those micronutrients that their body needs. That's absolutely true. Yeah, the lower your calories, the higher your risk of nutrient deficiency. Um, as you eat more and more calories, you don't have to worry about it as much. You know, it's just not as critical. So that's a very, very good point. And I think we're on the same page as far as you know, build your metabolism, eat nutrient rich foods, though I think where we differ is I'm team protein. I say, let's eat the protein first. But then I say that people can choose between having either fat for fuel or carbs. Though I usually push people towards doing more fat for fuel because I find that fat fills people up and keeps them full and satiated. And then they're less likely to overeat. Whereas with carbs, totally can lose weight eating carbs, but I find carbs make people hungrier. Like for myself, if I have an apple in like 30 minutes, I'm hungry again. And so if someone's trying to lose weight and they're feeling hungry all the time, eventually they're likely gonna have a day where they just say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna overeat. And so that's why I usually push more people towards the fat for fuel because I just find it keeps them happily full and less likely to overeat. And, and I, I kind of agree with you on the like, it could be carbs or fats, but a little bit not both. So in a way that's true. Um, you know, you see people on very low fat, um, high carb diets doing fine, very high carb, low fat diets doing fine. You combine the two, you get into trouble. You know, all of your combinations of carbs and fats together are very hedonic and that's your, all your donuts and your pizza and your candy bars. And they're like, you know, equal amounts of carbs and fats. However, however, and here's the caveat, all of that is occurring in a low-ish protein space. If you're, you know, 10, 15, 20% protein, yeah, you better keep your carbs and fats separate. These are all low protein scenarios. If your protein is crazy high, boom, protein's 40%, then yeah, carbs and fats exactly straight down the middle, 30, 30, 30% each. I mean, that's what I'm doing. It's like, as long as I keep protein super high, I can eat... Uh, half my energy calories from carbs and half from fat without even worrying about it. all of your bodybuilders, all of your bikini models. There, if you look at what they're doing, they're just keeping protein insanely high 30, 35, 40%. And then it's kind of 50 50 carbs and fats. Like they're usually not going below 20 or 30% fat and they're not going below 20 or 30% carb. It's very, you know, 40, 30, 30 is very common bodybuilding split, you know, if you get that protein high, if protein's like the most dominant macro, then you can go right down the middle on carbs and fats. But in a low protein setting, then you're screwed if you're eating carbs and fats together. That's your uh, baked potato with sour cream. You know, that's your tortilla chips or whatever are just like, you know, 40 to 50% carb, 40 to 50% fat, and protein's low at 10% or lower. And that's the problem zone. And that, that's also, I think, where people get hungry an hour later is when they eat, you know, something that's very carbonated, carbish, carb, carbly. I don't know if those are words, but um, that has no protein in it. You know what I mean? Like all your fruit is like low single digit protein percent and you are hungry an hour later, you know, after you eat an apple. I mean, I eat apples, you know, it's, it, lots of weight and volume, lots of fiber, but it, it's a side dish to a ton of protein. And again, protein's always dominant. And then you're, you just don't have to worry about it as mm -hmm. much. Okay, I guess another reason why I usually push people towards more fat and protein versus carbs is because I find many people are not moderators. And so if I say have a little bit of carbs, it turns into a lot of bit of carbs. And I think we can kind of see this through, just statistically speaking, the vast majority of people in the world are obese or diabetic, and they didn't get that way by just having an apple a day. For many people, if I say have one piece of fruit, it can turn into 10 pieces of fruit, then turn into binge eating on chocolate cake. So, but now I will have protein and fat for dinner. Then I'll take a walk around my neighborhood, come back and I'll have yogurt and a piece of fruit. So I don't know if we're considering that me having protein, fat and carbs 
in one sitting, but I know that some people are nervous about the Randall cycle. So yeah, what are your thoughts on the Randall cycle? Right, right. So <clears throat> anytime you're eating carbohydrate, you're just immediately downshifting fat oxidation until the carbs are all gone. And that's what the Randall cycle is. You have such a tiny amount of storage in your body for carbohydrate that as carbs are coming in, fat oxidation has to go down. So you burn all the carbs up and then you go back to burning fat again. And it's just a very nice little seesaw. It's happening so smoothly and perfectly in the background that you don't have to, it doesn't have to be under any kind of conscious control. You don't have to micromanage that with like the order your foods in or anything like that. Your body's going to manage all that for you. You know what I mean? It's just absolutely not a concern. But yes, the Randall cycle does um, slow down the release and oxidation of fat from your fat cells when carbohydrate is present. It does the same thing if you're drinking alcohol or any other more volatile macronutrient that has a higher oxidative priority because you don't have room to store it. I'm more worried about the hedonic behavioral part of carbs and fats together. So if I just give somebody plain baked potatoes, they're going to eat like one. But you have a baked potato with, you know, butter and sour cream and bacon. Okay, you're going to eat like twice as much calories. So um, it's, it's for me, it's more of the, the taste and the behavior and the hedonic side. And I really don't care about the Randall cycle because your body just takes care of that. That's not something you have to think about consciously. You know what I mean? Okay, so you're more worried about the hedonic behavior, meaning carbs and fats combined together taste really delicious. And so then people tend to overeat when they have palatable, delicious foods. So then if someone has 20 pounds to lose, what would you recommend that person eat to try and lose weight? Well, okay, so first of all, it's all about the protein, right? For me, if you're trying to get leaner, it's all about the protein. Protein should be the focus of every single meal, every single snack. You're centered on the protein. You're focused on the protein. Protein should be the dominant macronutrient. Um, and then any carbs or fats are just like coming along for the ride. So you get, in my opinion, a fairly lean protein because it's easy to add more fat or more carbs to it. You know what I mean? Like if I buy, if I have a skinless chicken breast or some sirloin or something, I can always cook it in butter. I can always add heavy cream. I can add cheese. I can very, very, very easily, almost too easily, definitely too easily add a crap ton of fat, crap ton of carbs. Every side dish is going to add fat, carbs, etc. So you might as well start with the leanest protein you can. Then, you know, you want some sort of side dish it has a lot of weight and volume for not a ton of calories. And if you're in a pure carnivore world, that's uh, egg whites or fish and seafood. These things are very low energy density, ton, uh, way more filling for the same amount of calories. In the plant world, of course, you can just eat any kind of a vegetable. They're all so low energy density that um, it's ridiculous. Like carrots or something, you, uh, you'd have to eat 18 pounds of carrots to get 2,400 calories. So that's like an absurd, absurd amount of weight and volume and satiety. So you take someone who's pure carnivore, who's just eating bacon, and their whole day's allotment of calories is like a pound of bacon. But you could eat 18 pounds of carrots and get the same amount of calories. So this is like a crazy satiety boost, in my opinion, which is why another reason why I think going pure carnivore might shoot some people in the foot, especially people who are volume eaters who like really like to feel full after a meal. You know, you're binge eating people, your volume eating people, some really high energy density animal food might not get them there. Like your butter and your bacon and your heavy cream, the caloric density is so high, you're only eating a half a pound of food and that's it. So I, I do like throwing in some sort of lower energy density food if you can. If you're pure carnivore, that would be egg whites and anything out of the ocean. If you're not, it's like fruits and vegetables. I guess I really never spent too much time thinking about low energy dense carnivore foods. Cause usually I would say if someone wants, if they're a volume eater and they want more bulk to their meals, then I would add, you know, like you said, vegetables or like romaine lettuce is probably the first thing I think about. Like if you want to, if someone's a binge eater, instead of first, we want to address why is this person binge eating? Like, is it related to stress, boredom, childhood trauma, we do want to work on that. But in the meantime, if someone wants to binge eat on romaine lettuce, like that is a great way to add bulk and substance to the meal. Um, what are your thoughts on stevia? 
I know some people are more nervous that stevia can be damaging to the gut microbiome, but I haven't seen anything that proves this. You know, a lot of people, they're eating sugar. And if they can just start having more things sweetened with stevia, it's inevitably going to have less calories. And if someone just tries to have no sugar and no stevia, and it works for them, great. But for certain people, they're just gonna feel so deprived of having that sweet taste. They may just end up binge eating on sugar. Whereas if you gave them something with a little bit of stevia, it might fulfill that feeling of needing something sweet. And therefore the stevia may actually help them with weight loss since they're not going to be binging on sugary desserts. So I guess, what are your thoughts on stevia? I mean, honestly, I, I never met a sweetener I didn't like. I'm drinking the absolute hell out of these all the time. There's just basically no, you know, show me some outcomes data. Show me some real world randomized human controlled trials for artificial sweeteners are actually bad on any kind of scale and I'll be impressed. But uh, artificial sweeteners are fine. They're great. They're awesome. They satisfy a sweet taste that humans naturally have for no calories. We have all of these actual randomized human controlled trials looking at water versus diet soda and people lose more weight on diet soda versus water because you get this sweet taste satisfied for no calories. That is amazing. I love it. I consume sucralose. I consume aspartame. I use a stevia all the time. I love uh, monk fruit, erythritol. All this stuff is great. My, my favorites are probably erythritol, monk fruit, stevia, um, but I'm not afraid of Splenda, sucralose, or aspartame, or any of these things. I know there's a lot of chemophobia in the carnivore world. It's like, oh, you know, like, look at all the chemicals in these plants. And I'm sorry, I'm tired of being afraid. Show me uh, an actual human study where this stuff is hurting people, like, please, because it's just not there. And in the meantime, I'm not going to be afraid to eat a salad. Like, what kind of extreme wuss would I be if I was afraid of a vegetable? Like, seriously? Are you kidding? <laughs> so, yeah, I I'm drinking artificial sweetener in a second. Don't even know which one. Couldn't, couldn't care less. Okay. I'm not afraid. Bring it on. You're funny. Um, does your opinion change on whether or not someone should be having carbs to lose weight based on if they're insulin resistant? Like if someone has elevated insulin levels, would you suggest that they don't have carbs to give insulin a break? Um, so the whole insulin thing, I couldn't care less. Like protein spikes insulin more than, or just as much as carbs and more than anything else you can name. So clearly spiking insulin is not a problem. The vast majority of insulin in your body is just responding to how much fat is in your fat cells. Your fat is constantly trying to leave your fat cells into circulation, and insulin is like a dam that's holding all that fat in. The, the vast majority of your insulin is just trying to maintain the level of fatness you have. It, it doesn't really, the, uh, the spikes from certain foods is not very important. Uh, what's more important is how over fat or thin you are. That is the majority of insulin. So like, okay, for example, let's say I'm super lean and my fasting insulin level is a one or a two. I eat a meal, mixed meal, whatever, goes up to like a 30, hour or two later, back down to a one. I have patients who come in who have abdominal obesity. Their fasting insulin might be 10, 15, 20, 50, 70, 90. They eat a meal, their insulin's, you know, two, 300. Once they can't pump out that much insulin, that's when they're diabetic. So they have just this massive, massive, massive wall of insulin. The vast majority of it is just all night when they're asleep, all day, every day, just constant wall of insulin trying to hold the fuel into storage. Even if their fat cells are overfilled, they're trying to shove that fat in there and keep it from spilling back out. And that's why the insulin goes higher and higher and higher and higher and higher as you get more and more over fat because your cells don't want any fat. And so you're having to force it in there with this insulin. So you can really think about fatness and over fatness as the main contribution to insulin. The um, mealtime insulin is a drop in the bucket. You know what I mean? It's a drop in the ocean. The ocean is how fat you are. And you want to be thinner with basically eating less calories and doing more exercise. That is how you control your insulin. Big picture. Uh, mealtime fluctuations is literally just almost meaningless. It's really how fat you are. Okay, I see what you're getting at. It's that if someone has chronically elevated insulin levels, then they have a meal, it spikes a little bit, 
then comes back down to these chronically elevated insulin levels, that small spike for an hour or two after their meal is not that big of a deal. The bigger deal is why do we have these chronically elevated insulin levels even when we're not eating? And so that's what we need to work on. And to reduce our chronically elevated insulin levels, we need to lose weight. Exactly, yeah. Your level of fatness is just the vast majority of the area under the curve for insulin for the day. And the mealtime ups and downs are trivial. It's, it's basically noise. And the other thing is a lot of people think, okay, you know, if I just don't eat any carbs, I'll be fine. But I, you know, I have patients who are you know, horribly diabetic. They're very, you know, morbidly obese. They're extreme hyperglycemia, very uncontrolled diabetes. And these people will go on zero carb diets, carnivore diets. But you know what happens when you eat a bunch of fat? Like if you're a diabetic, let's say you've got a freestyle Libre on and you're diabetic and your A1C is like eight and your blood sugar is not controlled. And if you just for dinner, just drink an entire gallon of heavy cream, just like tons of fat. Your sugar doesn't go up right away, but overnight it just go, it starts going up and up and up. And the next morning you'll have the highest morning sugar you've ever seen, even though you eat no carbs at all. That's how fat works. You get this extreme delayed reaction where all of that fat just slowly makes you fatter. And now you're that much more insulin resistant and your sugar is even higher. And people don't understand that. People don't realize that. They're like, oh, if you just don't eat any carbs, how can you ever be diabetic? That is not the point. Uh, diabetes is purely being over fat. So let, let's say I'm a let's say I'm a 600 pound, extremely uncontrolled diabetic. My blood sugar is 500 all the time. I have an A1C of 12. I'm horribly diabetic. The amount of glucose in my body is tiny. I still have 300 grams of glucose in my muscles, 100 grams of glucose in my liver. Another. 20 grams in my bloodstream. That's it. That's it. That's all the that glucose in my whole freaking body. I've had diabetes for 20 years. I'm 600 pounds. My sugar's through the roof. All of the glucose and carbohydrate in my body is like less than a pound. And everything else is fat, just fat everywhere. Like my every fat cell is maxed out. All my subcutaneous cells are maximum diameter. Visceral fat cells are maxed out. I've shoved as much fat in my liver as I can. I've shoved fat in my pancreas, my heart my blood vessel, I've got fat shoved in every nook and cranny in my body, and I'm horrifically insulin resistant. And only once I run out of fat storage, does my blood sugar start going up because all my cells are refusing glucose, right? And that's when you're diabetic. And it's a disease of being over fat and having too much fat in your body. And then people are just looking at their glucometer and just seeing this blood sugar reading, but it's really, there's just this giant ocean of over fatness and a little bit of glucose floating on top that you're measuring with your glucometer. And then you're like, oh, I'll just not eat carbs and I'll be fine. And people just don't, they don't get it. They don't understand. They do not know what's actually happening. You're making me think about the phrase, burn fat to lose fat, or you have to be in ketosis to lose weight. And I feel like I can't say this enough in videos because it's probably one of the most popular questions I get, which is, do you, don't you have to be in ketosis to lose weight? And no, you do not have to be in ketosis to lose weight. And you could even, all weight loss comes down to is not overeating. So you could even be in ketosis and be over consuming fat. And even though you're in ketosis, you were not going to be losing weight if you're overeating. Right, it really just comes down to fat balance at that point, right? You know, if you're, if you're eating more fat grams and you're burning, you're not losing weight. Um, so it does come down to fat balance. And just to clarify, you're saying that if someone has weight to lose, you don't care if they have a problem with their insulin or not. You don't care if they eat a high carb diet or a high fat diet, as long as they're focusing on protein and they're in a calorie deficit. Absolutely. That is absolutely right. Now, I, I will say that most people end up eating fewer carbs than the standard American diet. Like you pointed out, the average American is doing like one minute of exercise a day and they're eating 300 grams of carbs, which is absurd. Like you know, you should be eating probably half of that. But at the same time, nobody's under eating fat. I, I've never seen people who are, who are not eating enough fat unless they're anorexic or something like that. But yeah, it's not like people are not eating enough fat. But yes, people are eating too many carbs in general. And so I agree with carb reduction.
you just have some r wiggle room to go back and forth between carbs and fats. And I honestly don't like people to go too low in fat. It's a really bad idea. You're just going to be hungry and not feel well. I don't think anyone should be ever below 20% of their calories from fat, probably 30. But I also feel the same way about carbohydrate. I don't know that it's wise to go all the way to zero. I like, you know, at least 10, 20%, maybe 30%. I do prefer protein dominant scenarios when you're eating this way. But then I think it's, it's probably best to have a little bit of both. Well, I think many people are nervous to have too much protein. Um, I'm five foot, two inches tall, maybe 110 ish pounds. And I eat at least 150 grams of protein each day, easy. Um, but there's all the rumors that too much protein, bad for longevity, the colon, kidney, you're going to have kidney disease with all that protein. Though I think what you're going to say is there's there's no evidence to support this. That's not true. Right, right. That's really not evidence based. In fact, we do have studies with protein intakes that are, you know, about two grams per pound of ideal body weight. And that seems to be fine. Um, we have studies of four grams per kilo. It's, it's, uh, we have studies looking at pretty high protein intakes, higher than what you're doing, and it doesn't seem to cause any problems at all. So it's not really evidence-based. I think that's purely mythical. And yeah, somebody would have to show me a study that indicates that because it's just not out there. I'm wondering what does a day in the life of Dr. Ted Naiman look like? Because, you know, you're working in a hospital, you're also working out, eating good, and you're 51 and you're in great shape. So what does a day in the life of Ted look like? Like what time are you waking up, working out, going to bed? What do your meals look like? Full day in the life. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so um, I do like a, like a light intermittent fast. I do basically a 16-8. I think it's like microscopically beneficial. I, I would never push it down to like six hours, four hours, one meal a day. That's like where you really start getting diminishing returns and it starts actually going backwards at a certain point. But I like a light intermittent fast, 16 8. I skip breakfast just because it's more convenient. It's probably better from a circadian point of view to eat that eight hours earlier in the day. But I'm like in a hurry. I have to get up at the crack of dawn and go see a bunch of patients. You know what I mean? I'm seeing my first patient at like seven in the morning. So I get up super early and I just skip breakfast entirely and just drink an absurd amount of coffee. Like I drink a ridiculous amount of coffee and uh, just basically push my eating to like lunch and dinner in a roughly eight hour window. I'm not super religious about it. Um, the first and last meals of that window, I really book in with protein. So I ate a ton of protein, first meal, last meal. That way I've got you know, amino acids in the system pretty much 24 seven. I eat lots of super lean beef, you know, the leanest thing I can get in the store, the 90%, 93%, 95% lean ground beef. I'm eating uh, skinless chicken breasts. I'm eating uh, skinless chicken thighs, a lot of uh, chicken. I eat a lot of fish, any kind of fish, anything out of the ocean, scallops, uh, shrimp, seafood of any kind, love it. Every single day, some sort of fermented, low carb and low fat dairy. Low fat cottage cheese, low fat Greek yogurt, eating a lot of that. Probably one serving of whey powder in there somewhere a day to like just like one scoop of uh, whey. I'm always trying to eat something that's going to give me weight and volume from the plant kingdom with a, without a lot of calories in it. So I like things with soluble fiber in it. It just really fills you up for hardly any calories. Apples, apples are amazing. I eat, you know, probably half a dozen a day. Carrots, love it. Eating a, a lot of carrots. Potatoes, I, I air fry, I you know, make french fries and air fry them, and I don't put any fat on them at all. And I eat those. Huge satiety per calorie, like ridiculous. So I'm eating these carb, these simple, you know, single ingredient carbohydrates that have a lot of satiety per calorie. And um, that's kind of like a side dish. Most of my fats are coming from olive oil, any kind of fruit oil, avocado oil or olive oil, some nuts here and there, but not a, not a ton of those. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I drink a lot of non-caloric beverages, green tea, black coffee, diet soda. Like I said, not really afraid of the artificial sweeteners there. And then um, I think you asked me what time I go to bed. Uh, super late. I only sleep like a couple hours a night. It's like I might go to bed at midnight and wake up at 530 or something like that. So I'm doing everything wrong in terms of like protecting my sleep. I'm sure like Dr. Huberman would be upset that I don't have, you know, eight hours and uh, 
but yeah, so not really probably prioritizing sleep as much as I should be. Holy oh, and then you ask me, like when I work out, I don't like to work out in the morning. Um, most people have a higher discomfort tolerance later in the day, late afternoon, early evening. That's when you're best able to um, handle discomfort. So I can push it a lot harder um, later in the day. So I like to work out later, like late afternoon, early evening. That's when I'm doing cardio. That's when I'm doing resistance. I try to do basically at least three resistance exercise sessions a week and at least three cardio sessions a week, if not a little bit every day. Wow. You know, people say that I work out a lot, but yeah, you, good for you. Um, and you had mentioned too that there's diminishing returns when people do more of a condensed eating window. And I do agree if someone's not eating enough in their restricted eating window, then I think that it can be problematic because again, if you're not eating enough, how are you getting in enough of those micronutrients? And then also I find that if people eat just one or two big meals, it can be pretty hard on their digestion. It's a lot of work for the body to have to process all that food. But other than that, is there any other reason why you said that there's diminishing returns? Absolutely. So uh, basically, as people get older, if you're super old like me, the muscle protein breakdown is your biggest concern. So if you don't have amino acids in your system, you're just going to be burning muscle. And so you're going to lose muscle, honestly, if your eating window is too small and you just don't have amino acids available 24 hours a day. So I like a wider eating window, especially for anyone who's trying to either build muscle or preserve muscle from breakdown which is honestly everybody. So yeah, that's why I don't think one meal a day is optimal. And I guess my last question is, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice, let's say 10 years ago, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, wow. I would probably say just be less religious and um, listen to everybody, follow everybody, look at what successful people are doing, and then realize that, oh, there's a hell of a lot of successful low fat people and vegan people and carnivore people. And you can't really turn a blind eye to any of those just because it doesn't fit your narrative. You know what I mean? So, and I think I, if I could go back, I would just be like, Hey, be more open-minded. Don't be as dogmatic. Try to zoom out a little, uh, follow people outside of your silo, that kind of thing.